Well, good evening. I got a little bit crooked right here and I'll get straightened out. All right. I hope everybody's had a, a very good week to start out, especially after Easter Sunday, celebrating our resurrection day of uh, our Lord and Savior. And, uh, you know, just thinking about all the things that he has done for us. He's given us life worth living for. And uh, he paid the price that we couldn't pay. And so tonight I want to do a little bit of uh, speaking on about changing your image. Because I, every once in a while, run across people that, uh, you know, have thought of doing great things and circumstances and situations that they've got themselves into ends up giving them uh, a negative outlook on their own self um, you know instead of being able to have a, a wonderful uh, fulfilling life it ends up being like they're a prisoner to bondage and uh, whether it be drugs alcohol or whatever it may be and to really just to give up on life. And we're going to look at one person that uh, had pretty much just given up on doing what he thought he was going to be doing uh, four years earlier. So if you got your Bible, I want you to go to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to look at Moses. And uh, because of um, what he went through, if we look at his lifespan, the first 40 years, then the next 40 years, and then the last 40 years, is that he went from uh, being part of uh, Pharaoh's house to being exiled as a, a wanted man for committing murder and then became the leader of approximately about two million people, according to estimates. And, uh, but it wasn't easy on him, because after he fled Egypt, he went into the land of Ethiopia, and uh, it was while he was there that he married uh, his wife, she was an Ethiopian, a black woman. Her daddy, uh, Jethro, uh, he was, uh, had a ranch and everything, and Moses, more or less, was, uh, took care of the herds and everything. In other words, he is, you might as well say, uh, basically just uh, married into the ranch life and did whatever is necessary. And then he had that encounter with God, and that was the turning point. And then, like I said, now he had been uh, he had been in Ethiopia for around forty years at this point in time, so he's about eighty year old. And I know that a lot of people, by the time they get forty five, fifty, or sixty, they almost quit having any hopes of a right future or any major events that would be uh, life-changing or anything of that nature. And uh, so let's look at how he thought because this is what we have to look at. What God wants us to do versus how we see ourselves. And so I'm going to show you how Moses seen himself, yet God had a different agenda than what Moses did. Now, in verse um, 10, God says, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, listen to what Moses said. And Moses said unto God, Who am I 
that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. You see, he done started thinking, who, who am I? I think we've all somewhere along the line felt like it, or I know I have. Who am I? Who am I to to speak in front of uh, certain dignities or, or people? Who am I? And then in verse 12, when God said, and he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Now, with that said, let's look at Moses again, what he says in verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your father has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? I mean, Moses is trying to get out of doing what he knows is God directing him to do. And, uh, uh, matter of fact, if we go over, I mean, Read all of them twain. I'm just going to give you some what how Moses pictured himself. Because how you see yourself often determines how far you can succeed for God. Now, we have to humble ourselves, absolutely. And as it says in Isaiah uh, chapter 1, if we be willing and obedient, we shall eat the good of the land. I think that's verse 17 of chapter 1 of Isaiah. Uh, and, and that's what we have to do. We have to be willing and obedient. Now, Moses was struggling because he's thinking, I've been, I've been just being a rancher helping my father-in-law for the last 40 years. And here God wants me to go back from the land that I left because I was a wanted man for killing an Egyptian. Verse 1, Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared to him. And then in verses 2, all the way down to verse 9, God has him go through some things, and it just unbelievable. I mean, uh, he turned a rod, uh, laid a rod on the ground, and it became a serpent, and then he picked it up, and it became a rod. He stuck his hand in his, in his bosom and pulled it out, and it's leprous, stuck it back in, pulled it out, and it's normal. I mean, now, God was really being patient with Moses. Lord knows he has to be patient with me sometimes. And that's the thing. <laughs> Why do we make it so difficult when God gives us a task at hand? You know, you, you not, the devil is not going to have you thinking of doing something great for God. That's a God thing. The devil's going to try to get you to think like Moses. Well, I can't do that. Oh, who am I to do that? And see, that was what was going on with Moses. Let's look at verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And... He had some type of speech impediment, whether he stuttered, uh, you know, 
that's highly possible. And uh, I've known people, I've worked with people that uh, stuttered. Uh, one, of, one of my, our co-drivers back years ago with, and uh, he would stutter, and we'd give him a hard time. I mean, we didn't make fun of him, but we would, uh, if he got upset, if you looked him in the eye, the more you looked him in the eye, the more he would stutter. And he'd get blink in those eyes, and finally he'd just close his eyes and <laughs> tell you what he thought. And, uh, but you talking about uh, uh, being an excellent driver and doing all that? Uh, he was. So, I mean, his ability to do a job wasn't hindered by his speech. And look what God tells Moses in verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? In other words, God says, Moses, I know how you talk. I know how you speak. And I've chosen you. See, God may have very well be telling you something that, you, that needs to be done, and you're giving him reason, or not reason, excuses. Because reasons can be justifiable excuses, a lie because you're afraid to try. And you're giving God an excuse. That's what Moses is doing. Lord, 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 you know, I can't talk plain, and, and I'm having all this problem and, and everything. And God just says, you know, Moses, I know how you talk. I know what happened 40 years prior. I'm not concerned about what happened 40 years ago. I'm not concerned about how plain you talk, how eloquent you speak. I've called you to go into Egypt and confront Pharaoh. And... Uh, in verse 13, he said, Oh, my Lord. Wait a minute. Let's get verse 12 because God says this. Now, therefore, go, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And then, look, here's another excuse. And he said, Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he come forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Thou shalt speak unto him, put words in his mouth, and I will be thy mouth with his mouth will teach you what you shall do. I mean, sometimes we just press. We just press, I'm, I just can't do this. I just can't do it. Not realizing that God doesn't call those that are perfect for the job, or chore a hand. But God uses those that will humble themselves to him. He will equip you with whatever you have need of. And too many times, especially in this day and time, as Christians, we need to have boldness, instead of silence and back hid in the corner, we need to come out of the closet. We need to be the ones that are leading the way to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be examples to a lost and dying world, 
to be a difference maker instead of trying to fig find excuses for reasons that we can't do what God is more than able to equip us. You know, that's why I think about God's grace. And God's grace, the three P's, is God's grace, is God's provision, God's presence, and God's power. Right off the bat, God told Moses that I'll be with thee. We know according to the word of God in the New Testament, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you until the ends of the world. Well, so he's not going to leave us. He said that we would, in St. John, chapter 14, 15, 16, that he would send the comforter, and the comforter would teach us, would speak through us. The problem is we're afraid to let God work in our lives. And that's why we have to change the image of how we see ourselves. In other words, instead of seeing ourselves as a nobody, a failure, a flop like Moses did, who am I? As I said, I've been there, done that. And I'm learning, I'm learning that God doesn't change his mind. He wants, when he wants us to do something, it's up to us to do it, if it's going to get done. And God don't always change and put somebody else in your place. Because if he has to put somebody in your place, then he's taken them out of their place. So who's going to take their place? That's sort of like one time a young man that was coming to church and uh, he'd been praying uh, wanting a certain job at work and oh he was getting uh, frustrated I mean weeks went by months went by and finally Lord told me to tell him and I had talked with him I said do you realize what God has to do to make that job available for you. He's got to find somebody that's willing to change the job. That there's got to be an opening somewhere. There's got to be people that are moved around to make that job available. There have to be people that'll come take your place. And so it takes a while. And it wasn't it wasn't just a few months later he got the job that he was wanting. And he said, you know, I, I, I hadn't never thought about all the things that had to go through because the position that came open, the guy finally decided he was going to retire. And that opened it up. The guy, uh, the guy had a good job. And so if he hadn't have retired, he probably wouldn't have quit. But he took retirement. So then they had to find somebody to fill his uh, young man's place so that he could move up to train to take that job. And sometimes we complicate things by not moving when God says to move, not doing what God says to do, all because we have, we feel that we're inferior, that if we try, we might mess up. Well, it's better to mess up than not to do anything. Uh, yeah. Keith Hagen, senior, he, uh, he said one thing. It's better to start in the, in the flesh and work your way into the spirit than not start at all. And that's true. I mean, you've got to start somewhere in learning to hear the voice of God. Learning that when you're weak, it's he that is strong in you. And that's what Paul had to learn. When he had that master Satan that had been sent to buffet him, that was giving him a hard time. 
I could imagine somebody being sent saying, Paul, who do you think you are? You was having Christians murdered, put in prison, put in jail, beaten, and everything. And the, and you call yourself a Christian now? I'd be ashamed. No. And no doubt, that took a toll on, on Paul. And he said, three times I sought God, and on the third time, whether in body, out of body, whether in heaven or out of heaven, he said, I don't know. He said, God spoke to him and said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. In other words, God said, Paul, my provision, my presence, and my power is more than enough for whatever you face. And Paul learned then, when I'm weak, he is strong. And he said, I'd rather therefore gladly rejoice in my infirmities. In other words, Paul said, when I can't do it, I'm just going to praise God because I know that he's going to do it through me. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to work through you. You have to be willing and obedient. You can be obedient, not willing. You'll miss out a blessing. You can be willing but not obedient. You're going to miss out a blessing. You have to be both willing and obedient. Then you're going to be blessed. The choice is yours. Don't anger God. And, and as I said, I'm preaching to me as much as anybody else because it's time that we quit making excuses when God has called us to do his work, his will here in this day and age that we live in. From most Christians' viewpoint, we are closer to the return of Jesus Christ than we have ever been. He could come this evening. He could come before we get through here. And yet then again, he may be a hundred years from now. But we're called to be ready. We're called to be faithful. We're called to be praying and watching. And so to do that, then you need quit making excuses. Quit looking at your weaknesses and start looking at God's strength. And when you start looking at God's strength, just like read all of chapter 3 of Exodus, read all of chapter 4 of Exodus, and you'll see what God was doing. And the things that he did in the latter part of chapter 3, as I said about the rod turning in serpents, and then picking serpent up, and it turned in rod, Sticking his hand in his bosom, then pulling it out, and it'd be leprous, stick back in and come out normal. That's a miracle. And that's what God was trying to, to get Moses to understand. Moses, there is no excuse that is viable with God. We can't find a reason. Because if God calls us, he's going to equip us. He knows our weakness. He knows our faults. He knows our failures. All he's looking for is for us to be willing and obedient. So don't look in the mirror at your frail body and your stinking thinking. Let go and let God work through you. And the sky's the limit of what God will do through you. How many souls can you save? How many lives can be changed? How many people can you influence? All because you become willing and obedient to God. Instead of trying to find a loophole, an excuse to get out of doing it, say, okay, Lord, if you call me to do it, then help me. Give, give me the words. Give me the words, Lord. And God will do it. The Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples, he said, there'll come a day. Don't take no thought of what you're going to say. Let the Holy Spirit speak through you. And that's where we're at right now. We need to start, quit taking thought about who we are and start saying, okay, God, 
Okay, Holy Spirit, you speak through me. You do what gives God the Father glory and our Lord and Savior glory and honor. And then just praise your way right on through. And it'll, you'll be surprised. We'll all be surprised at what God will do in our lives. Well, I want to just give you a brief and I hope an uplifting teaching tonight so that it doesn't matter what you passed. don't matter. It's what matters is what you're getting, going to do next. And if you will yield yourself to God, you'll never regret it. So, again, we invite you to come join us Sunday morning. Mountain Harvest Church at about 10 after 11, use of when we get started. Of course, we do it live on Facebook, upload on YouTube just as well. We do live Bible study t uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 6.30 and upload it on to YouTube. Uh, on YouTube, it would be past, uh, Mountain Harvest Church, Pastor Randy Brewer. And there's a whole list of different messages that you can listen to. And uh, got any questions, don't hesitate to message me or uh, text me or whatever. Because the worst thing is when you don't understand and you go away not understanding. As a pastor, it's my position to help, to teach, and to equip you to be mature in the Word of God, to be able to walk in the Spirit, and God use you in a great and mighty way. As always, before we close out, is your life right with the Lord Jesus? Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Or have you backslid on God? If you've never accepted him and you've, or you've backed on God, let's pray this simple prayer. Let's get right position with God. Get right standing with God. And if you'll believe with your heart, confess with your mouth. So you just pray with me this simple prayer. Father God, I come to you in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of all my sins, all my faults, all my failures, Lord God. And Lord, as you cleanse me, I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit that from this day on that I can serve you, I can live for you, I can give you honor and glory in every aspect of my life. And so, Lord, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, know that you're on a new path. You're a new creature with a new feature. And I look forward to tomorrow evening, same time, 6.30. And I hope and pray that everybody has a blessed night, a great tomorrow. And matter of fact, the whole week be just wonderful. I know a lot of people are going through battles, going through struggles. We're praying for them. I know we're praying for people that are needing healing. God is still a healer. He paid for our healing when he went to the cross at Calvary almost 2,000 years ago. And so it, his healing power is just as strong today as it was then. So we just keep on praying till something happens. Well, God bless you, Pastor Andy, and from all of us Mountain Harvest Church, we love you. Again, we invite you to come be with Sunday, and I'll see you tomorrow evening.